prominent figure in the debate about Islamization in Europe, presenting a range of arguments that he believes illustrate the dangers associated with this phenomenon. His stance touches on various critical aspects, including national security, cultural integration, economic impacts, and... How do you feel about Brother Tate becoming a Muslim now? How do I feel about him becoming a Muslim? Mm. Um, I'm disappointed. Mm. Um, Tate's, Tate's a genius, yeah? Mm. He's a very clever man. And what he's doing now, he's always done. Yeah? He's tried it with multiple different... So Top G, he had Mr. Plenty before that. Have you seen his rap song? Yeah, yeah, it's awful. Oh, bruv. Yeah. Like, I've done some fuck-ups in my life, man. I wanted this <laughs> on the podcast. Say, bruv, I've fucked up sometimes, man, but what the fuck? But, uh, so Tate... Everything he says, so it's like Katie Hopkins. Oh, do you know the type of person you're at? Yeah, well? I know Tate, yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah, Tate's from Luton. I know him. I've been out to Rome. I went out to Romania to, like, I went out there in 2017, spent mm. a few days out of him. But he's a very, and Tate was, Tate was, Tate's mentor is a man called Amir, a Muslim man, Bosnian special forces from mm. Storm Jim. Mm. Very well respected. No one would have, everyone I speak to, because my friend tra is one of the main trainers at that gym, everyone likes him, yeah. Muslim, non Muslim, he's a great guy. Tate, I think, puts a lot of his, a lot of his, um, value come I'd say comes from the teachings of that man as well yeah? mm -hmm. and his guidance from him so everything takes as Tate carried on talking over the years I'm looking thinking well that's Islamic that, that fits in with Islam that fits in as he's talking about what he sees and women and his views on multiple wives and mm -hmm. all of these things fit into it, the teachings of Islam mm -hmm. and Islam also at this time is the only group Muslims are the only group in the UK who will stand up against the LGBTQ plus uh, sexualization of children. Mm -hmm. That's the only group of people. They're, they're very principled in their values and they will not back down. Mm -hmm. Yeah, They don't bend. Islam ain't going to bend. You Isn't bend. that a good thing? Yeah, for them. Because yeah. you're similar to you as well. No, you, it's fair. Yeah, you yeah. Have your, yeah, I respect certain things. The resilience. The resilience and, the, uh, and it will not bend. You'll bend before Islam bends. Mm -hmm. yeah? Your country will bend, your laws will bend. Islam won't bend. The Muslim community will not bend. I don't know if you've seen this story. So a Muslim, Muslims are protesting outside the schools in Birmingham about the LGBTQ plus thing. Yeah? Mm. Uh, they teaching kid boys, they can be girls. And that, and I looked, I sat there and, and they were all, they're outside the schools. Oh, well, this the teacher said, I want to abolish heteronormativity. Heteronormativity. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, so yeah, that's, yeah, yeah. it's about them enforcing a political ideology within the children. Yeah. About sexualizing them and changing, uh, and they again they they don't want you to have a, a dad, but they also want you to be weak. They want the men to be feminized. They don't, they want you to be confused because you're easy to control for whatever what they've got planned for the mm -hmm. future. So the Muslim, I reached out to that. I went out to the Muslim geezer's house and I thought you're being labelled as extremist. I, I'm a dad. I agree with everything you're saying. Yeah, and Muslim, but the way they got round that, they labelled them as extremists. The parents were called extremists, and then they got court injunctions banning them from attending the school. So then it's it's gone away. But that you're right, the woman behind that education process in Birmingham, she said five years prior that it, she wants to smash heteronormativity. So this is a teacher saying uh, she wants to smash men and women being together because they don't want it. And I said, now now they're indoctrinating and they're calling it diversity and, and inclusion. So no, that's not inclusion. You're not. And, and with my, that ain't happening with my kids. But so many parents now are letting it happen within our communities. Because of political correctness. Because they're scared. Yeah, but the, the abolishment of heteronormative roles <clears throat> a lot of people don't know and, and one one thing I'll say heteronormative and that movement is very different to the homosexual movement because homosexuality has always existed through yeah. years of time and uh, apart from regions where the holy books were enforced when I talk about the trans movement it all started with Alfred Kinsey I think in like the 1960s I think it was if my memory serves me correctly and his whole idea was he performed studies and he had the idea that children should be sexually free and be free to be whoever they want to be and he's recorded to have done sexual studies on kids as young as like nine months and that he is the doctor of this of this and they know that getting to the kids what, what you hear in your first seven years is it and he, but he he was he similarly to antifa where he was a marxist and that's what he wanted destroyed the nuclear home yeah you should look into alfred kinsey he's the emergent obviously yeah, so people, it all starts. people who, <clears throat> who from that group now say okay that's what it started as it was something negative and it's morphed into something else they see as positive but the birth of that movement that's, that's, that's marxist yeah he, that's, he, that's he also practiced people. on people like mental health and joe as well so he, his, his studies were very 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 contentious from the beginning robinson emphasized his national security as a primary concern regarding Islamization. He argues that increased Islamic influence could pose significant threats to European safety and stability. According to Robinson, the rise of Islamic extremism and radicalization represents a serious risk, particularly when linked to incidents of terrorism and violence that have occurred in various European cities.
He cites events such as the Paris attacks and incidents in Berlin, London and other cities as proof of the potential dangers. Every British person today is offended with people shouting Allah Akbar! After two years below the radar, he's back, promoting a new movement in the UK against radical Islam. Having left the EDL, the English Defence League, Tommy Robinson now wants to tell the world that the EDL was the wrong way to confront radical Islam. The aggression, the booze, the football hooligan element, he claims, all of it wrong, and the extreme right-wingers. I've gone out there and I felt a little bit ashamed of how we carried ourselves off in England, but at that time, it's what, it, it's what was needed. We were young um, and we were angry. Instead, he says this is the way we go in the UK. 40,000 gathered for a Pegida rally in Dresden. Robinson was on stage there and is now launching Pegida in Britain. You say you want to stop Islamic immigration? Yes. Right. What about building mosques? Uh, we need to stop the building of mosques, temporarily. The same with the immigration. Look, we'll assess it again in five years' time. If, 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 if we've got right, to... So ban on, five year ban on immigration if you're a Muslim, five year ban on building mosques. Yes. The majority of people in Britain are concerned with the Islamification of the country. The major majority of people are concerned with the effects literal interpretation of Islam is having. But Robinson's now the manager, backstage. So meet the would-be frontman, former British soldier, then fighter with Kurdish forces against the Islamic State, or Daesh, but a wannabe leader who wouldn't give me his surname before the cameras rolled. No leader of any movement that's gone anywhere doesn't give their full name. What, what's the problem with that? No, I will give my second name in, right, what in is the it? future. So, um, what is your second Scott. name? Scott. Scott? Yeah. Right, OK, fine, we can clear that one up. Yeah. So that obstacle removed, me, we got you, on you know, to what really worries Pegida. And it's very important the truth gets out there. That's the most important what thing. What is the truth, then, that, that, that we're missing here? What's the big truth? The big truth is what's going on around the country. Yeah, what is it? With girls getting groomed. OK, these are facts. OK, girls getting groomed. What, what else? What's yeah, um, the youth getting radicalised within Islam. Um, there's so many things, you know. Well, that's so. two. OK. Um, just all, all stuff to do, you know. Well, what? I mean, you say there's a problem. When I ask you what it is, you can't tell me. Right, with, OK, with radical Islam, what, I, what I've seen in, um, obviously, Iraq and stuff like that, if we were to get to that stage, like I said, that's my main concern. Okay, well, it I mean, Iraq was run by a, a, a tyrant on an industrial scale. Going to go down that road, that's preposterous. Yeah, but th this is exactly it. This is the, the thought process of people that people think, oh yeah, that's just how it is. What, what, do we wait until it gets that bad? No, it's best to prevent what's going on, you know. Pegida attracts large crowds for anti-radical Islam rallies across Northern Europe and has mostly avoided the thuggery of the extreme right. And that is what Robinson and Scott now want to bring to Britain. Robinson is particularly worried about the potential for more attacks if radical Islamic groups are not adequately monitored. He advocates for stringent security measures, including enhanced vetting processes for individuals entering Europe from regions with a high prevalence of extremist ideologies. Robinson's position reflects a belief that European governments must adopt more rigorous policies to prevent potential threats from infiltrating their societies. He argues that the current security protocols may be insufficient and calls for a re-evaluation of how security screenings are conducted. Another major aspect of Robinson's argument concerns cultural integration. He believes that the cultural values associated with Islamization can create conflicts with European traditions and societal norms. Robinson suggests that the growing presence of Islamic communities in Europe could lead to a clash of values, potentially undermining the social cohesion that is vital for a harmonious society. Um, you talk about not feeling safe in your hometown. Well, I, I am from Rotherham and we were shocked and disgusted by everything that happened. And it was hard enough living in a town that had to deal with that. But then the following weekend, the EDL and other members of the far right came to our town. Where are you from, sorry? I'm from Rotherham. Rotherham, okay, yeah. yeah. And me members of the f groups of, from the far right, like the EDL, the BNP, came to our town. And we had to lock ourselves away in our houses, 
people who are Pakistani or Muslim because they didn't feel safe in their town. Two streets away from my house, the EDL, members of the EDL and these groups were smashing shop windows and cars. My dad was assaulted because he was a Muslim taxi driver by members, by men who identified themselves as members of these groups. And my question to you is that you talk about Muslim extremism as you should because it is a problem. I'm not denying that it is, but you don't mention attacks from members of the far right that attack other people or members from the far right that go around think, thinking it's acceptable to physically harm others. You focus on Muslims, you place the onus on Muslims to speak out, which Muslims do speak out, and I think that they should, but you don't focus on these groups that do this. You don't talk about how these groups aren't representative of the EDL or other groups as a whole. I know that you've left the EDL now, but when you were a member, you didn't, and I just feel like there are tensions on both sides, and both sides, both sides should be held accountable, but... There are, there are, but I think to compare... I think to compare groups on the far right with Islamist terrorism who wish to kill, murder, maim, and they are killing, they are murdering. There's no groups of EDL or groups of the far right picking up young Muslim girls and raping them. It's not happening, OK? I know it's disgusting and sick if, if your dad's been attacked. We're talking, you're from Rotherham. The grooming case from Rotherham. A local councillor, Muslim, went to court and gave a character reference for the, the groomers. He gave a character reference. The ex-mayor, who's a Muslim, went to court and gave a character reference. After that court case, once those men were convicted for rape, disgusting, sickening crimes against kids, there was no outcry. I'm, try, I'm not trying to justify any of it. I'm just trying to... I remember looking at it and thinking, hold on. A councillor has gone to court and gave a character reference for a paedophile who's raped a kid. And he ain't lost his job. And, and yet, I, when you say I don't speak out, I actually hate the far right. The real far right. As we've seen, who the far right I see as the far right. I don't think it's right to bracket every people who are, who are critical of, of Islam as an ideology. It is right to condemn what you're saying is acts of violence against innocent Muslims. But... The reason why I don't speak out as much about them is because they're not blowing things up. They're not murdering. I haven't really seen many incidents or any evidence of the crimes like in comparison to what we're seeing. I don't think that... You see, the far right is going to grow. As we grow on in the, next, in the coming years, it is going to grow. Um, you will eventually see an attack from the far right on, on, on innocent Muslims, whether it be a mosque. But, it's like 95%, 5%. The biggest threat to world peace is ISIS, Islamist ideology. So that's why, as you said, I, I don't speak about it as much. I do think it's something that, again, the government may not really address until something really terrible happens. But I'm sorry that you experience those things, but I don't speak about them at an equal level because I don't think they are equal. He often points out that the integration process for individuals from Islamic back argues that there have been numerous instances where large-scale immigration has resulted in isolated communities that do not fully integrate into the broader society. This, he believes, leads to a fragmentation of social unity and can exacerbate tensions between different cultural groups. He asserts that successful integration requires more than just providing basic services. It also involves fostering mutual understanding and shared values, which he claims is often overlooked. Um, so what are you doing now with the Quillam Foundation and how is that different from what you've done in the past with the EDL and everything else? Currently, I'm not doing anything. I'm, I'm, I'm under, um, obviously I was on a license, I'm on a license condition. When I left with Quillam, I thought there was a, a very good opportunity to bring people from the EDL. I think most of them, I think it would surprise you. You know, like, you know, everyone has this opinion, don't you? You have this view. I think you'd be surprised if you met many of the people who were in English Defence League. It's like uh, I said to Quilliam, so Quilliam, we started organising meetings and then I got slapped with a condition that I'm not allowed to contact the EDL or I'll go to jail. And I felt um, a major part of it, of it was to try and find a middle ground on many issues. 
and bring those activists and those people around the table. That's what I thought would be a beneficial way forward. As I've said, I think that a beneficial way would be to prevent the erosion of our cultural identity would be for Muslims to help us do that um, on issues that... But I'm, I'm under a condition not to contact the EDL. I've been in jail. I went, I went into custody. Then I was on a, on a, on a tag. I'm on licence conditions now where I'm being, being warned about really what I can talk about and what I can't talk about. I don't think I'll be free till July 2015 to really look at what I'd like to do. Osama, you see, <coughs> within Quilliam, Osama's key, I think, because he's devout and he's religious. Maj is more secular. Um, so Osama, if every imam in Britain was like Osama, wouldn't have a problem. So what, but at the same time, Osama's views are not representative well, maybe not, 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 not representing of all the Muslims in Britain, but of all their leadership in the Imams. It's not representing. And uh, we need it to be. And that's a, a hard struggle, but I think everyone has their, their part to play. And I was questioning myself when I was away whether I played my part, and that's it. But um, I offer my hand of friendship to any Muslim who, who wants to tackle these issues, solve them. I think the only way to do that is to bring people together. I think to continue. Luton Borough Council, for example, just had a no policy, no dialogue. You can have no dialogue for 10 years, you're going to end up talking. You're going to end up talking. You're better off finding where you can agree on where you can't. Now, with Osama, I don't agree on everything with Osama. We're not going to. No one's going to agree on every policy together. We have differences of opinions on many things, but we can agree on what we think is best and what's right and, and how to move forward. As I said, I'm really waiting until July 2015. That's what I've got to do. Um, I'm going to plug my book here, so I'm writing a book and I'm going to tell everything that's, uh, that's gone on, tell the truth, and want to, want to, because there's a lot that hasn't been told. Robinson also addresses the economic implications of Islamization. He argues that the financial strain of accommodating new arrivals, particularly those from regions with significant Islamic influence, could put additional pressure on public resources. He highlights concerns about the costs associated with healthcare, housing, and social services for these individuals, suggesting that these expenses could be substantial. Robinson is critical of what he perceives as a lack of thorough economic assessment regarding the impact of rising immigration. He argues that European governments should carefully consider the economic ramifications of their immigration policies and prioritise efficient resource management. Robinson believes that the potential economic burden of accommodating large numbers of new arrivals needs to be addressed proactively to avoid placing excessive strain on public finances. What's the connection? How did you and Tommy Robinson come about? Yeah, we're both from Luton, so we both know each other and we've always kind of known each other. And I've always understood his patriotism and his desire to have the UK a Christian country and with full of English people. I don't think that's a bad thing. I don't think it's ever bad to be patriotic about the place you're born from. But um, obviously I completely disagree with him on Islam now. At the time, I kind of, I'm not going to say I agreed with him, but I understood his points. But uh, I really look forward to having a conversation with Tommy. That'll be a really interesting podcast because I think he, he has a lot to learn still, I believe. Let me say this in a very diplomatic way. He talks about, you know, the indoctrination of children and how the country's failing and all these things. And he, he, he's trying to find the opposite force to contest these things. And the opposite force to evil is always going to be good, which is God. And I'd like to think he believes in God, but I guess he's a Christian, which is fine. But if the Christian church has no teeth, if the Christian God isn't feared, how can it be God? How can you have a God you can mock? How can you mock God and nothing happen? How's that God? Is that the God you believe in? It's not the God I believe in. So I think he's going to have to accept that there's a logic fail somewhere in his thinking. If he wants an, a good force to oppose evil and he accepts that that must be God, then the God must be powerful. It can't be a weak God. So how can you say it's not Islam? But we'll see. We'll talk to him about it. It'll be yeah. interesting. It'll be an interesting conversation. And I'm not here to convert anybody either. That's not my intention. But yeah, Tommy's saying a lot of the problems with England is Islam and Maybe for a time, I would maybe thought he had a point when it came to patriotism and that kind of thing, but I, I must disagree with him because it's the Muslims who are protesting against the indoctrination of children. It is the Christians that put him in jail. 
Muslims didn't put him in jail. Christians put him in jail. Yeah, I look forward to talking to Tommy. I don't want to give away all my talking points now, but uh, it was the white Christian judge that put him in jail. Political ideology is another critical component of Robinson's argument, expressing concern about the potential shift in political dynamics and societal values. Robinson argues that the rise of political Islam could threaten democratic principles and freedoms that are central to European identity. He points to examples of political movements and parties that advocate for Islamic values and Sharia law as evidence of a broader ideological shift. Robinson contends that such developments could undermine the democratic institutions and cultural norms that define European societies. He believes that protecting these values is essential for maintaining the integrity of European political and social systems. In short, Tommy Robinson's arguments against the dangers of Islamization in Europe are multifaceted, addressing national security, cultural integration, economic impact, and political ideology. His perspective reflects a broader debate on how European societies should navigate the challenges posed by rising Islamic influence. Robinson's stance highlights the need for a balanced approach that considers both the risks and opportunities associated with this issue, aiming to protect national interests while promoting social cohesion and economic stability. Let me know your thoughts in the comments below. And for more content like this, be sure to subscribe to the channel.